truth is, I hate taking tests. Even if I'm prepared and I know all the subject matter, I am not a great test taker. It creates this anxiety and this stress and feelings of inadequacy for me. First of all, I used to procrastinate studying. Then I'd psych myself out, almost creating that self-fulfilling prophecy of failure. It's like through a test score, my whole life is being measured or judged. Those same feelings I have about test taking kind of carry on in my own life. I tend to worry about being good enough or feel like I am judged. In the last part of this passage from Hebrews, it says, because he, Jesus, was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. Well, bring it on because I could use someone to help me take this test of life. In reality, our whole life is a testing ground for passing and for failing. Let's talk marriage. Some people win at choosing the right life partner, and yet sometimes things go sideways. Education. Some people excel in academia, and others gain wisdom through life trials. Finances. For some people, everything goes straight. Savings account, retirement, steady income, while others have many financial ups and downs, career changes, and scrape along, barely making it to the next paycheck. Even the people who we think may have it all struggle in some way. The reality is, life is a test. But it's through our struggles, our test taking, that we grow, we learn, and we mature. The good news is God sent Jesus to become human, to take the test for us, so we can all graduate and achieve entry into the most elite of places, eternal life. Remember in our scripture, it says that Jesus became one of us. So he starts out being born in a stable surrounded by animals, and his crib was a feeding trough. His parents had to flee Herod to keep him alive. His life story begins like scenes out of an adventure movie. Jesus was not always welcome. He was made fun of. He was rejected. He had gifts and talents that no one understood. He didn't have indoor plumbing. He didn't get a car when he turned 16. He just walked hot, dusty roads that became his social media platform. And occasionally, he used a boat as a stage. So when we feel like no one understands us or life is really rough, remember you are in good hands because Jesus forged the same path of trials, of disappointments, losses, and rejections that we may go through. In fact, for 40 days in the wilderness of horrific testing, he sealed the deal by not giving in to Satan. Through bearing all of our mistakes on a cross, he sealed the deal. By his teachings in life, he sealed the deal so we no longer have to fear death. So why do we fear death? Having some anxiety about death is an entirely normal part of being human. In 2016, there was a survey of the top 10 fears for which Americans reported being afraid or very afraid. Death of self and that of a loved one ranked number six and number nine of all the fears. The highest was being afraid of a corrupt government. Another survey showed that older people tend to fear death less. While some may think this is opposite of what it should be, seems the older we get, the more life experiences we have, the more experience we have in handling death and grief. It turns out that the way we think about death can also affect how we live out our daily life. Our interactions with danger 
may change our fear of death. Though some experiences make you less fear of death, to many might increase your fear of death. Here's an example. In a very cool study, researchers recruited beginner, intermediate, and expert skydivers to share their feelings about death. Not surprisingly, beginner skydivers with only an average of one jump under their belt were scared to death. Intermediate skydivers with an average of 90 jumps were a lot less scared of death. But this is the interesting part. Expert skydivers who had jumped over 700 times were more scared of death than intermediate skydivers. This shows that simply risking death more doesn't decrease your fear of it. There may be a learning curve where getting some experience makes you feel less anxious, more confident, and you gain a greater sense of control. But getting a lot of experience makes you more aware that you can't cheat death forever. When thinking about the fear of death, ask yourself, what's the worst that could happen? Well, if you have a deep faith and an understanding of Jesus' role in salvation and atonement, then you understand his promise of life everlasting. So you also begin to believe there is more to come after death. Jesus came to deliver us from the fear of death and the bondage that fear and death impose on our life. In reality, we still die. At last count, the death rate hovered around 100%. But through Christ, we have the hope of life eternal, life with God. So if Christ conquered death, then why do we fear death? For some, their faith and their understanding are still maturing. For others, it's the separation, the loss of someone's physical presence with us that we grieve. This is very understandable. We miss them. Yet, if you have experienced the death of a loved one, there is this strange but real connection that continues. Through my own grandparents, aunts and uncles, and most recently my mother's death, there is a new type of closeness in a spiritual, spirit-type way. What seems to come to the surface are the good memories, or perhaps items we inherited become more cherished. We may feel their presence when we're out walking or when we're making a recipe that was theirs. We begin to savor that love, that relationship, and the impact they had on our life. They physically may be gone, but their spirit continues to live on within us. My cousin Jennifer, who was just two years older than I, died after a short battle with cancer 21 years ago. After her diagnosis, she shared with me that the one thing she needed to accomplish before she died was to make sure her two daughters knew God. I am sure she had many conversations with them during those short six months, but it was at her passing she sealed that wish. For her daughters tell the story that as she took her last breaths, and her pulse ceased. This big smile came over her face and she looked up and they knew in that moment she was someplace beautiful and wonderful. Those type of stories have been told over and over. This passage in Hebrews and Christ's atonement on the cross seals the deal for each one of us. Jesus did not come to save angels. He came to save each one of us. This meant that he had to take on a fight against Satan to disarm the belief that our sins are unforgivable and will keep us out of heaven. Even though there may be churches that threaten, if you sin, you are out of luck with God, this is not true, nor farther from the truth of Scripture. Reality is that people make wrong moral choices out of self-preservation or immature thinking. 
The readers of Hebrews in this passage are reminded that they're, they are no longer subject to such slavery, a fear of death. For they and all of us can face death with the same confidence that Jesus had. Atonement has to do with making amends or repairing the spiritual damage caused by humans. God realized we are not perfect. We're going to mess up. But on the other hand, he loves us. So, in keeping with God's holiness and his love, God devised a process by which we can make us holy again so that we are all received with open arms into life eternal. May you live a long life. Enjoy the testing ground. Let the refiner of life buff us up, remold us, and make us better equipped to do his will. But just remember, we do not have to fear the end of this life, for there is more to come. Have no fear, for Christ sealed the deal.